St. Vincent Ferrer, Part 5 Section the Fifth The marvelous gifts which shone forth in St. Vincent Ferrer Chapter 13 St. Vincent Ferrer favored with a multitude of visions, revelations, and ecstasies the secret of hearts revealed to the saint. Vincent Ferrer daily beheld in his private prayers, and even in the course of his apostolic preaching, either pious souls who still lived on earth, or the souls in purgatory, or the saints in paradise, the angels, the blessed Virgin Mother of God, and our Lord himself. He was one day praying for the conversion of souls, when he beheld a fervent nun of the order of St. Francis doing as he did. Her eyes were bathed in tears, and she was prostrate at the feet of our Lord. He heard Christ say to her, Thy tears, my daughter, are most agreeable, and I joyfully hear thy prayers. But these ungrateful and guilty people, who outrage the law, and blaspheme my name, who have little claim on my pity. On the contrary, they provoke my justice. At the same time our Lord revealed to the saint that this nun was Colette, the illustrious saint who labored with much fruit for the reformation of the sisters of her order, Vincent was filled with admiration and delight at this spectacle. On another day, while he celebrated Mass at Valencia, on his return from one of his apostolic journeys, he saw appear before him, and as it were over an altar, a woman surrounded by flames, and holding in her arms a little disfigured child. Astonished at such a vision, he adjured the woman, in the name of the Lord, to tell him who she was and what she wanted. She was one of his own sisters, named Frances, who had been dead some time. She had married a rich merchant. The latter, having been obliged to undertake a long journey, the chief servant of his house profited by his absence to constrain his wife to commit sin with him under the threat of death unless she consented. She was weak enough to yield, but, recovering from her fright and being covered with shame in her own eyes, she poisoned the man to rid herself of his foul presence, and as she had conceived, she destroyed the offspring before it was born. To complete her misery, she dared not avow these crimes in confession, and added to these murders numerous sacrileges. At length remorse filled her soul. She made her confession to an unknown priest, with the greatest sorrow for her crimes, and died three days afterwards. God having condemned her to an expiation of terrible duration, she addressed herself to her brother to abridge its strength, its length. She indeed appeared again to St. Vincent three days afterwards in glory, crowned with flowers and surrounded by angels in descending to heaven. Thus she did disappear from his sight. The rest of the family gave him the purest consolations. He beheld the souls of his father, mother, brother, and other sisters ascend to heaven without passing through the flames of purgatory. While he was one night sleeping in the convent at Cervera, in Spain, St. Dominic appeared, and the rays of light which surrounded him were so bright they woke Vincent. My son, said the glorious father. The Lord has commanded me to visit you, to impart to you 
the most useful instructions which will redouble your ardor and enable you to pursue the course of your apostolic preaching with much fruit. Yes, my son, added the founder of the order, persevere till death in the path on which you have entered. Your works are most pleasing to God. The fidelity with which you discharge the duties of your profession shall merit for you in heaven the same degree of glory which I myself enjoy. You resemble me perfectly in the observance of the rule, and in your personal holiness, virginal purity, and zeal for the salvation of souls. Like me, you have been sent by Christ to preach and to teach the gospel truth. And I am the root and trunk of the order. You are one of the most fruitful branches and fairest flowers engrafted thereon. Persevere then in your way, so that, having arrived at the term of your pilgrimage, you may reign eternally with me among the happy citizens of heaven. Vincent humbly himself humbled himself profoundly, thanked the Blessed Father for his precious visit, and fervently commended himself to his intercession. While the interview lasted, the two saints spoke so loud that several of Vincent's companions, who slept in an adjoining room, were awakened. Peter de Moya, peeping through the chinks of the door, saw in Vincent's cell a venerable religious, whose countenance was so radiant with light that the whole place was illumined. On the other on the following morning his disciples, conjuring, conjecturing that, he, that their spiritual master had received some extraordinary heavenly favor, asked him what religious had appeared to him on the previous night. Vincent was desirous of concealing from them the favor he had received, but they importuned him so much that he related to them what had occurred and requested them to preserve a rigorous silence on the subject of the vision till his death. One of the most interesting angelical manifestations occurring to our saint was that of the angel guardian of Barcelona. On entering the city he saw, near the gate, a young man resplendent with light, holding a sword in one hand and a shield in the other. The saint asked him what he was doing with arms in that place. I am the angel guardian of Barcelona, said he. This city is under my protection. In the first sermon which happened, which followed this remarkable vision, Vincent related what had happened to him, congratulated the inhabitants of Barcelona on their happiness, and exhorted them to offer their thanksgiving to the angel who guarded them. This they did by building a small chapel on the very spot where the angel appeared to the holy preacher. Very frequently, also, when Vincent was in the pulpit, people saw the angels forming a crown around his head. One cannot doubt that the visions of the Blessed Mother of God to her faithful servant Vincent were also very frequent. A sacred image of Mary was for a long time preserved in the convent of Valencia, which, it is said, spoke to him. And St. Louis Bertrand, being one day asked if this were true, he gave this remarkable answer. It spoke not merely twice or three times, but continually, for Mary dealt with Vincent as the tenderest of mothers. It is also clear that our Lord Jesus Christ frequently appeared to him, as at Avignon and Perpignan, and when he 
himself miraculously cured him. But Vincent's humility concealed those graces so effectively, and they seldom came to the knowledge of men. It was by Point's pious stratagem only that he was seen raised into the air in his cell, surrounded in the night but with an immense light. While staying in a Benedictine priory in Jocelyn, in Brittany, the monks frequently went in the night to watch him in his cell through the chinks in the door. They beheld him sleeping on the floor, with his Bible for a pillow, and his face beaming with a splendor which illumined his cell. Amazed at this spectacle, the good monks permitted Count de Rohan to witness it, on whose mind it made such a deep impression that he from that moment became an example of sincere piety. The saint received these choice graces with deep humility and a wise caution. He counseled his disciples not to curiously desire them, and to wisely resist them, seeing that the spirit of darkness transforming himself into an angel of light, may easily substitute himself for God in these circumstances, when they were not animated with the request, requisite dispositions. The discernment of spirits was marvelous in the saint. There was at Barcelona a person named Louis Caltado, who suffered severe pains in the head. The man had no faith in the daily miracles of Vincent, but, experiencing no relief from any remedy, he went one day in desperation to the church of the friar's preachers, and at that moment when Vincent descended from the pulpit, he said to him, Father, I have suffered frightful pains in the head for two years. I implore you to cure me. The saint replied, I am neither God nor a doctor to cure you. At this the sufferer understood that the saint knew the secret thoughts of his incredulous heart. But aided by God's grace, he put all his hesitation and asked him one more, and yet I firmly hope you will grant me this favor. But do you really believe it? said the saint. Certainly, my father, answered the other. Then Vincent placed his hand on Louis's head, saying, Thou art already cured thank God, and believe that they who serve him are invested with great power. The cure was so complete that during the space of forty years which he lived the man never experienced the slightest pain in the head. One day a person named Gaja came to the saint and importuned him to admit him into his company. Vincent was very willing to receive him but told him to sell beforehand all that he possessed, and distribute the price of it to the poor. This man obtained four hundred gold pieces by his sale. He secretly kept back two hundred of them, gave the rest to the poor, and then went to inform the saint that he had executed his commands. At these words Vincent, fixing his eyes on him, said, Man of little faith, thinkest thou that the least thing you would be wanting to thee in my company? Thou imaginest, perhaps, that I am ignorant of what you hast done? Go, thou hast given only half the money to the poor. I refuse thee as a member of my company. I do not, I do not want to sti disciples of this stamp. At this reproof, so unlooked for, the man cast himself at the saint's feet, implored his forgiveness, and promised to bestow on the poor the sum which he had withheld. This promise satisfied Vincent, who, seeing him resolved to obey, tenderly embraced him, and admitted him into his company. One of the pilgrims who followed the Apostle of God was interiorly disposed to doubt the miracles and conversions which he saw accomplished by the Thaumaturgus. 
He watched his words and actions in order to turn them to ridicule after the manner of the Pharisees, whose eyes were always on fixed on the Savior of men with a view to find fault. One day Vincent accosted him and, looking intently at him, began to lay open to him all the thoughts of his heart, all the censures and criticisms which weighed upon his soul in regard to his apostolic doings. He did so truthfully and with such energy that the disciple, confused and repentant, threw himself on his knees and humbly besought his pardon. Vincent readily accorded it to him, but at the same time gave him a paternal caution. Pay attention, said he, to what you do yourself, not what others do. An Aragonian named Don Ferdinand belonged also to the saint's company. He was not sincere. He affected exteriorly a sanctity which he had not at heart and was all the more culpable, inasmuch as he removed himself further from the true perfection taught by the Holy Master, and generally practiced by his companions. This hypocrisy was so exquisitely refined, so artfully concealed from the eyes of all, that, humanly speaking, it was impossible to detect but celestial light never failed St. Vincent in penetrating a secret. He once took the person aside and said to him, Really, if I did not know that you would one day undertake great hardships for my honor, I would chase you from my company, for you are wicked. These words covered Don Ferdinand with confusion and filled him with remorse. Dear Master, answered he, pray to God for me. The saint replied, I have already done so, and it has been vouchsafed that you shall not be condemned. You shall, moreover, prosper exceedingly on the earth and live for many years. Pro procure then the book entitled Imitation of Jesus Christ and read it. It turned out as Vincent predicted. Don Ferdinand, in fact, embraced a most virtuous life. He prospered in his career and even began, became chaplain to the king and bishop of Telesia. By the year 1454 he was at Naples, where he contributed to the canonization of St. Vincent by rendering testimony to the many miracles which he had seen performed under his own eyes. He left him so high an opinion of his virtues as to verify the latter part of his master's prophecy, you shall not be condemned. When he heard the confessions of sinners, Vincent miraculously assisted them in discovering the faults which escaped their recollection. But what is still more remarkable is that, during his sermons, he would sometimes fix his eyes upon people whom he had never before seen or heard, and he would enter on the subject of the sins which they usually committed, laying open the circumstances so clearly and with such precision that the people were accustomed to say, This man is truly a saint, for he knows the most hidden secrets of our hearts. Was it a usurer, an adulterer, a thief? an assassin, a person guilty of the foulest crimes, the saint's words came home to him with such truthful effect that at the end of the discourse he succeeded by his close reasoning and eloquence inflamed with love in converting them from vice to a life of, of justice and penance. God exhibited to the prophet Ezekiel the abominations of his people, at the same time therein that the prophet lived that he might exhort them to repentance. He bestowed the same lights on St. Vincent Ferrer. 
Whenever he preached, he saw the sins of people and the wounds of souls. It was in this that rendered his speech so full of wisdom, so prudent and efficacious in correcting vice. Chapter 14 St. Vincent Ferrer endowed with the gift of prophecy, the grace of mir miracles accorded without measure to the saint. God, of himself, and through the instrumentality of his saints, revealed to St. Vincent Ferrer his own predestination, and the glory which would surround his name in the Catholic Church. This was not enough. He moreover willed that the saint's own lips should announce it to the people. On one occasion, therefore, when preaching at Alexandria at Piedmont, he thus spoke to his auditory, My brethren, I have good news to tell you. There is a young man among you who will be the glory of the seraphic order and of Italy. He signified St. Bernardine of Siena. He will take my place among you when I shall have returned to Spain. His heavenly life and holy teaching will bear most abundant fruits. He will become a great light in the church, and will honor him before it accords the same honor to myself. The prophecies contained in these words were literally fulfilled. Bernardine of Siena having entered the order of St. Francis, preached in Italy, died in 1444, and was canonized in 1450, some years before Vincent himself was canonized. Preaching one day at Valencia, the saint openly declared that he should die in the odor of sanctity in a country far away from his native land, and that his body would perform a great number of miracles. The prophetic spirit unfolded itself still further in him. He even specified many of the particular circumstances of his canonization, and especially the personage who would render him that honor. This occurred many times. The first was at the Chateau de Canals, not far from the town of Extiva, on the passing the chateau, he met a lady named Francina, the wife of Dominic Borgia. She was a little advanced in pregnancy, and was not certain of it. Vincent assured her of this, and added, The child which you bear will one day be Pope. Sometimes afterwards, in the year 1378, say the historians, passing by the same place on his way to preach at Zativa, Vincent saw Francina holding in her arms a child which she had given birth only a few days before. Take great care of this little child, he said. It will be Pope and will canonize me. Some months elapsed and one day that Vincent was in the company of some of the child's relations, it chanced that his mother arrived with him in her arms. The saint embraced him, then, turning to the company, said, Kiss the feet of this child. A time will come when he will be created pope, and then he will canonize me. When the child was three years old, one of his uncles pretend again presented him to the holy religious who said, Make him study well, let him go to school, for he will one day become Pope and will render great honors to me. In fine, toward the year 1400, when preaching at Lerida, Vincent had among his auditors this young man whose infancy he had blessed, and of whom he had predicted so glorious a future. The student was so much impressed by the preacher that he went to see him after the sermon and said to him, You preach marvelously well, my father. You will be a saint, and you will be the one who, who will canonize me, replied Vincent. This prophecy, so often repeated, 
was fully realized. Alphonsus Borgia became a learned theologian and a distinguished canonist. He was canon of Lerida in Barcelona, cure of the parish of St. Nicholas, bishop of Valencia, and at last cardinal. When he had been elevated to so high a dignity, he felt so certain, on the saint's assurance, of one day being elected pope, that he made a vow to pursue the Turks from the moment he became sovereign pontiff. In 1455 he proclaimed the sanctity of him who had so often announced his own glorious destiny. To enumerate the saint's prophecies would be impossible. They had reference to individuals, communities, cities, kingdoms, and the universal church. Peter de Luna, abandoned by everyone, still obstinately persisted in his claims. His ambition will be punished, said Vincent Ferrer. This man will sink into universal contempt, and his body will become the plaything of children. This latter circumstance was verified at the time of the wars of succession in Spain at the commencement of the eighteenth century. The French being in possession of the Isle of Peniscola, some children dug open the tomb of that obstinate man and took out, one, took out of it the bones which served them as playthings for several days. Vincent gave at the convent of the friars' preachers at Valencia some interesting sermons on the saints who would flourish therein. This convent was truly a nursery of saints. We may cite, among others, the blessed Dominic of Montmajour, amateur Espy, John Micon, and especially the illustrious St. Louis Bertrand, with a great number of his disciples. We have spoken of the prophecy which the saint uttered at Barcelona, when the city was made desolate by a terrible famine. He announced in the city of Tulada, well, which was ravaged by the Moors, that it should be henceforth under cover of their incursions, and he added that the plague should never touch them. Both these prophecies were marvelously fulfilled. Vincent loved his country. He foretold with tears the revolutions which would disturb it. When they burst forth, he made every effort to restore peace to the state, and by his prayers prudence, firmness, succeeded therein. He, moreover, foretold the decisive expulsion of the Moors from Spain. In less than a century later, Grenada, their last bulwark, fell into the hands of Isabella the Catholic. But, according to the venerable Seraphim de la Poretta, a most learned and holy religious of our order, the distinctive characteristic of Vincent Ferrer was the preaching and the announcing of the Last Judgment. Yes, Vincent was the angel of the Apocalypse, as he proved at Salamanca, by raising a woman to life. He proclaimed that awful day as eminent and near. Let us observe, however, that this prophecy was combinatory, as was that of Jonas at Nineveh. Had not the world, world been converted by the preaching of our saint, it would not have subsisted it to the present hour. But it changed as, as did the Ninevites, and like Nineveh was saved, and its existence thus prolonged. God has delayed the execution of that terrible sentence, according to the expression of St. Ambrose, founded on Holy Scripture. God will know how to change his resolution, provided you amend your life. Otherwise, considering the rapidity with which time flows by, one might well believe that the proximity of the end of the world and of the judgment which will follow. 
St. Vincent foretold that a society of apostolic men would rise up in latter times, who would be eminent for their piety, and whose zeal would be extraordinary. We flatter ourselves that this prophecy is being realized in the order of St. Dominic itself, as has been shown in another work. The author writes, The life of St. Vincent Ferrer was a standing miracle, whose object was the living, the dead, persons in health, and those who were sick, the earth, the air, and the sea. In a word, all the elements. But what appears to us even more remarkable is the facility with which the holy Thaumaturgus wrought those wonders. It was easy for him to do this, says the venerable Louis of Grenada, as it is for us to lift the hand to the mouth. It was an habitual gift of his, a gift which he possessed even before his birth, as we have shown at the beginning of this work, a gift which accompanied his childhood, which increased with his youth, attained perfection in his manhood, especially when commissioned by our Lord to evangelize the world during the latter twenty years of his life. It was during that period that he regularly performed them every morning after his preaching. Ring the bell of miracles, he was wont to say to one of his disciples. He was sometimes entirely inspired not to cure all who presented themselves, but when they returned at the appointed hour he always finished by restoring them to health. Had he in the course of those years performed but eight miracles a day, they would have reached the extraordinary number of 58,400. But this calculation clearly falls far short of the mark, since it is a well-attested fact that the saint wrought them not only in public assemblies and in the pulpit, but even while traveling, while resting on his journeys. At every moment, so to speak, hence the common saying among his biographers, it was a miracle when he did not work miracles, and the greatest miracle was when he performed none at all. St. Louis Bertrand confirms their testimony. God, says this saint, sanctioned the teaching of Vincent Ferrer by so many miracles that there never was a saint since the days of the apostles to our own time who wrought more. God alone knows their number, and he alone knows the number of the stars that the people, that people the firmament. We have already related many of these miracles, and shall record others in the third part of our work. Still, we may be allowed to instance here some which deserve to be known and remembered. On the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, a frightful storm burst over the city of Barbastro in Catalonia, at the moment when the saint was investing, unvesting after Mass. The rain fell in torrents, and the lightning flashed, and thunder rolled with such terrific effect as to threaten all around with instant destruction. The saint, leaving the church, made the sign of the cross with holy water, when the storm was immediately appeased, and the sky became serene. Ascending to the pulpit, he exhorted the people to return thanks to the holy apostles for their favor they had just received, and said that, unless they had interceded with God, there would have remained neither leaves on the trees nor green herbs in the country. He added, Unless you beseech God to preserve your goods and promise to make a holy use of them, the next year... Another tempest will devastate the entire land. Eleven months later, and a terrible storm literally accomplished this prediction. St. Vincent was one day preaching at Berga in Catalonia with great fervor and unction on the most holy name of Jesus. 
A violent rain, which had been expected for many years, at length fell with great impetuosity. His audience hastily dispersed to find shelter. Some fled to the house of a Moorish smith, and sought refuge in a workshop built of dry wood. A good woman said to the smith, Why do you not come, as we do, to hear the sermons of the Holy Father? At these words the Mohammedan became furious. Cursed be your Holy Father, cried he, and with the sparks from his poor forge setting fire to the dried wood that was arranged around the workshop, he added, We shall now see what use you make of those servants. The fire rapidly communicated itself to the numerous materials that lay about, and the unfortunate people were speedily surrounded with flames. In their danger they invoked the holy name of Jesus. O oh, sweet Jesus, said they, your preacher, Master Vincent, told us that your name is the help of Christians. Deliver us from this pressing danger. In an instant the flames were extinguished, and the wood even ceased to smoke. This miracle astonished the Mohammedan. He was converted, and three days later St. Vincent baptized him. On another occasion the saint crossed the Ebro to Tortosa with all his company and boats that were too small to contain, without danger, the number of persons who filled them. The water soon got into the boats, and they were on the point of sinking. Cries of distress were heard on every side. They implored the saint to save them. He made the sign of the cross on the river. In an instant the boat ceased to take in water, and reached the shore in safety. Often did he miraculously multiply bread and wine and other victuals. We shall give a remarkable instance of this in the instruction for the second Friday after the saint's feast. Indeed, there were ways in which he manifested his gifts. Well-attested documents show that multitudes of people have witnessed him in the middle of his discourse suddenly assume wings and fly off to console and encourage some suffering person who sought his help and, having performed that act of charity, he would return in the same manner to continue his preaching. It is on this account that, like the angels, St. Vincent is represented with wings. God accorded the saint the gift of languages. Into whatever country he entered, although he preached in the Valencian idiom, he was perfectly heard and understood, and in conversation he spoke in French, Italian, English, and German, according to the country he was in, with the ease and fluency of his mother tongue. St. Vincent exercised a wonderful power over the devils. His word caused them to fly from the bodies of the possessed. It was frequently sufficient for him to touch those who labored under his dominion, to deliver them. Even his very presence constrained them to depart. But what is still more reasonable is that, in order to put the evil spirits in flight, it was enough to lead those who were possessed to the different places where the saint was in his journeys, and in places where he was not. They had only to pronounce his name in order to obtain the same result. It is useless to dwell on the saint's power in regard to physical maladies and bodily infirmities. He wrought miraculous cures by the thousands. His power was so supreme in this respect that he communicated it to others and even to inanimate objects which he had used. Frequently, when people came to ask these sort of favors of him, he would turn to one of his companions and say, I have wrought sufficient miracles today, and am tired. Do yourself what is asked of me. 
the Lord who works through me will also work through you. The prior of the convent of Lerida one day invited him to visit a lady who was a great benefactress to the order and who was grievously ill. My father, said the saint, you ask me and go to see this person that I may cure her by a miracle. Why do you not do it yourself? Go, I give you my power, not only for this infirm person, but also for all whom you may meet on the way. The prior went to see the invalid, and on his way came across five individuals who were suffering from diverse wounds. He cured them. Then going to the dwelling of the benefactress, he restored her to perfect health, in the name of St. Vincent. By divine favor he imparted the power of working miracles to another prior of his order throughout his whole life. As with St. Paul, so now with St. Vincent, God communicated the gift of healing even to articles of his dress. One of these was given to a poor but pious woman. The placing of his relic on the heads of the sick cured them, and their alms enabled her to live in comfort. The saint resuscitated more than thirty persons during his lifetime. We have related two of these marvelous resurrections in the spiritual instructions for the fourth and fifth Friday before the feast. We might instance another, others as extraordinary, but we must confine ourselves with, within reasonable limits. Section the Sixth The Death of St. Vincent Ferrer, 1419 Chapter 15 the saint dies at Vannes in Brittany, his burial, canonization, his relics. During a period of sixty-nine years, the great apostle of the fifteenth century fought the painful battle of life. For fifty years did he bear the austere yoke of the religious life, and in the course of twenty years he traveled throughout Europe, proclaiming, like another St. Paul, Christ's kingdom on earth, and producing in the souls of men a salutary change, a holy and happy revolution. It was but just then that the athlete should be recompensed, that the warrior should rest, that the conqueror should receive the palm of victory. Brittany was the land chosen and Vanes was the city predestined to receive the last breath of the man of God and to preserve his mortal remains. When St. Vincent became seriously ill, his disciples, seeing his strength rapidly decline day by day, earnestly besought him to return to his own country. They were in hopes that the climate of Valencia would be favorable to him, and were, moreover, deeply interested in securing for his own country the possession of his relics. St. Vincent was unwilling to pain the companion, companions of his labors by opposing their wishes. Towards the end of March, in the year 1419, taking leave of the Duke of Brittany and the consuls of the city, he quitted Vanes in the night, in order to avoid popular excitement. But God's designs were clearly manifested to the saint and his companions. It was revealed to him that he should die in the city which he was leaving, and on the following morning the company, after a night's journey, were astonished to find themselves, at daybreak, at the gates of Annas. The saint, turning to his companions, said, My brethren, let us not speak of returning into Spain. You see clearly that it is God's will that I should end my days here. They answered him only with tears. Then, entering the gate out of which they had passed the night before, he, he exclaimed, 
Hac requies mia in seculum seculae. This is my rest for ever and ever. The people were not slow in discovering who it was that had passed into the city, and they ran to meet the apostle whom they expected never more to behold. While the joy bells joyfully proclaimed his welcome return, the Duchess of Brittany met him, conducted him to the house of a gentleman named Prueline, in order that he might be more conveniently lodged than with Robin Scarb. The saint would not listen to the proposal. Instead of exhorting the people to repentance, as he was wont to do, he merely told them that he should soon die, and commended himself to the prayers of all. This announcement plunged the city into desolation and sorrow, and the multitudes hastened to pour forth their supplications to God that he would prolong the days of his servant. The holy apostle was meanwhile ordered to lie down on a bed, and he, until then, had never slept otherwise than on bare boards, or on the broken branches of trees. He humbly obeyed. A consuming fever, accompanied with violent pains, soon tormented him. He suffered in every member of his body, and seemed on the point of breathing his last. The physicians omitted nothing to save so precious a life, but St. Vincent declared all their remedies useless. He refused everything that could relieve his suffering condition, and it was only at the repeated solicitations of his friends that he could be induced to lay inside a hair shirt which he had worn for many years. The saint was joyous amidst his sufferings. His cheerfulness of heart was painted on his tranquil and serene countenance. Pain never troubled this heavenly peace, nor was he ever heard to complain, or to show the least sign of impatience. On the contrary, he esteemed himself most happy to resemble his sweet Saviour crucified. He consoled his disciples, who wept round his bed of pain, and exhorted them, for the last time, to charity, union, simplicity of heart, penance, and Christian mortification, zeal for spiritual progress, and perseverance. He also told them that he would pray for them. Ten days before his death, the Vish bishop of Vannes and the consuls of the city came to ask his blessing. He received them courteously, and with a smiling countenance, this was on the 25th March. He then blessed them, and promised them his protection in heaven. From that time he devoted himself to silence, recollection, and prayer. He made frequent acts of contrition, as though he had been a great sinner. On Monday in Passion Week he received the last sacraments and the plenary indulgence for the hour of death. Having received the Holy Viaticum, he desired to be left alone for some hours, that he might entertain himself more freely with his divine Lord. On Tuesday his sufferings became so intense that he could barely speak, but they inquired of him where he desired to be buried. If there had been a convent of St. Dominic at Vannes, he said, I should have wished to be buried at the feet of my brethren, but as there is not, I leave the matter entirely into the hands of the bishop and duke of Brittany. The fever increased so much in the course of the night that on the following morning he could not articulate. He made signs to a religious to inspire him with holy thoughts, and read to him the passion of our Lord, while he pressed his crucifix to his breast with greater love than ever. Then followed this recommendation of the departing soul, in which saint joined with deep devotion. At the close of that solemn act, his features were suddenly transfigured. 
his forehead beamed with holy joy, and a divine light shone upon his countenance and in his eyes. Paradise was open to his view, and he beheld the King of Glory, the Immaculate Queen of Heaven, angels clothed with dazzling splendor, and his own beloved patron saints coming forth to meet him. He joined his hands as in prayer, and imprinted on his crucifix a parting kiss. Then, raising his eyes to heaven, he murmured forth these words, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, and gave up his soul to God. This occurred on Wednesday evening in Passion Week, 5th of April, 1419. As soon as his soul took its flight to heaven, his body assumed an appearance so beautiful, so serene and radiant, that it seemed the reflection of eternal glory. His flesh, so long macerated by fasts and disciplines, hair cloth and the fatigues of the apostolate, became fair and luminous, as though it were living. So far from inspiring the natural horror which a corpse usually does, his smiling face filled those who looked upon it with sentiments of love and holy envy. What tears were shed over the sacred remains! The whole city was inconsolable at having lost its treasure, and came to venerate the saints' bodies. They kissed the hands and feet, touched his forehead with pious objects. His praise was on the lips of all. At the moment when the pure soul of our saint was leaving his body, the windows of the room in which he expired suddenly opened of themselves, and a flock of small birds were seen to enter. They were not larger than butterflies, very beautiful, and whiter than snow. They not only filled the chamber, but the whole house. When the saint drew his last breath, these little birds disappeared, but left the place scented with a delicious perfume. All were of the opinion that these were the angels who had come in that form to meet the saint and conduct his soul in triumph to paradise. Another prodigy was witnessed at the same moment. John Liquilic of Dinan had in his possession several candles which had been used at the saint's mass, and which he carefully preserved in a case in his room under lock and key. On the 2nd of February, 1419, being desirous to light them in honor of the Blessed Virgin, he went to get them, but they were nowhere to be found. All his efforts to discover what had become of them were of no avail. But what was his astonishment when, on the 5th of April of the same year, he found all the candles in the case, and they were miraculously lighted? He called his wife to witness the marvel, but neither of them at the moment understood its meaning. When it was afterwards known that that was the very day on which St. Vincent died, the prodigy was easily explained. Grave discussions arose when there was question of deciding who should be privileged to possess the saint's precious remains. The religious of his own order wished to transport them to the convent of Valencia, to which he belonged, or at least to one of their houses that was nearest to Vannes, for there was no establishment of the order in that city. The Franciscans, on the other hand, reclaimed against this proceeding, saying that, as the union of the two orders of St. Francis and St. Dominic obliged them to afford mutual hospitality in all places, where one or the other of them had no monastery of their order, it devolved on them to give a place of sepulture to the saint, inasmuch as there was no Dominican convent in Vannes. But the bishop, aware of the answer that St. Vincent, before his death, had given to Father Ives in Milleroux respecting himself, and the Duke of Brittany, 
decreed that the saint's body should be buried in the cathedral. He therefore ordered that the house in which the sacred remains lay should be closed, and a guard of soldiers set to watch it, and that the burial should take place at the hour of sunset. A solemn procession, consisting of the bishops of Vannes and St. Malo, the secular and regular clergy, the nobility and people accompanied the saint to the cathedral. It was exposed in the center of the choir, the face and hands being uncovered. On the following morning, when the solemn ob obsesquies had been performed, the bishop of Vannes deposited with his own hands the precious remains in a marble vault opposite the episcopal throne and near the high altar. Numerous miracles soon proclaimed the glory of this holy man. In the evening of the day on which the obsequies took place, a leper, prostrating himself on the slab of the saint's tomb, was suddenly cured. Multitudes of invalids followed his example and returned cured. Four hundred persons, says Goyard, were recovered their health by merely lying on the bed where the saint died. The sculptor who carved the tomb drew from the saint's gratitude a marvelous recompense. His leg was dangerously wounded and no remedy could heal it, although he had tried everything. He at length had recourse to St. Vincent. Friend of God, said he, good Father Vincent, pray to God for me. He had scarcely said these words when the pain in his leg suddenly left him, and in a few days the wound closed, and he was perfectly cured. These favors increased the devotion of the people, and to satisfy it they constructed an altar over the tomb. Other altars were erected in his honor in several of the Dominican churches. The process of his canonization soon followed, but various circumstances conspired to retard it. At length, Pope Callistus III, whose elevation to the supreme pontificate had so often foretold, together with the honors which he himself would receive from him, proclaimed the sanctity of the servant of God on the 29th of June, 1455, and fixed the celebration of his feast on the 5th of April, the anniversary of his death. The successor of Callistus III, Pius II, published the Bull of Canonization. The canonization was celebrated at Vannes with indescribable so solemnity. The saint's body was taken from the tomb where it was buried. It was still entire as on the day of his death. It was placed in front of the altar to be exposed to the venerations of the faithful. Many miracles were accomplished on that day and increased their confidence and devotion. A year afterwards the relics were translated to another tomb more costly than the first and more fitting to contain them. Grand fêtes were celebrated on the occasion, and a consider considerable number of distinguished personages took part in them. The inhabitants of Vannes were more than once exposed to the danger of losing St. Vincent's body. Towards the middle of the 16th century, a Spanish corps, sent by Philip II, having event effectually protected the city against the attacks of the heretics, the cathedral chapter were desirous of testifying their gratitude to the commander, Don Juan de Aguilar, and offered him a large fragment of one of the rib bones. But the soldiers had conceived the design to carry off the whole body. Happily the canons were apprised of it in time. At night they concealed the shrine which contained the relics, and did so so secretly that it remained unknown from the year 1590 till 1637. It was discovered at this date by the bishop of Vannes. The holy relics were then verified and a second translation took place on the 6th of September, 
a day which has been annually observed ever since to commemorate that event. During the years of revolutionary trouble and disorder which stained the decline of the last century, the people at Vannes were fortunate enough to recover the relics of St. Vincent Ferrer from the hands of the sacrilegious robbers, who profaned the churches and altars to enrich themselves with the sacred spoils. St. Vincent's body was always regarded as a precious treasure in the Cathedral of Vannes. Time had not lessened the devotion of Brittany towards its great apostle and glorious patron. On the first Sunday of September, the saint's relics are annually carried in procession throughout the streets of Vannes, escorted by the civil, military, and judicial authorities, and followed by an immense crowd of the townspeople. In times of the public calamity, especially those venerable relics are borne in solemn procession through the city to reanimate the hope and piety of its people. People only have the honor of carrying them. The houses before which they pass are hung with white draperies. During the cholera of 1857, a similar procession took place in Vannes, which was desolate, desolated by the am epidemic which had until then spared it, and this pious ceremony lessened the intensity of the plague. 